Calcium is space in number 12, utter blasphemy. When it says, all the religions of this world, the non-Christian and the Christian religion, agree with us that all religious efforts and all the efforts of the church are directed toward man. That's a literal quotation. Directed toward man. Sounds familiar to the one who has read about the Masons. Sounds familiar to the one who has read about blasphemies uttered at the United Nations or at the Presidio. Doesn't it? Now to say that all the efforts of the church are directed towards man is heresy and blasphemy. All the efforts of the church are directed towards God in reality. This market could go down a lot, you know. How much is a lot? Bob, well, I mean, we could have a bear market. I mean, we haven't had one in a long time. That's a 20% decline because we've had this yell and put. The Fed wouldn't let the market go down when uh, uh, Obama was president. They certainly didn't want it to go down uh, before the election because they wanted to put Hillary Clinton into the Oval Office after Obama. So they had the markets back. There was this put. But what if the put expired uh, with Donald Trump? I don't know if the Fed has much love for Trump. And now that Trump has put his brand on this stock market and this economy, maybe the Fed is happy uh, to allow a bear market well, that can be blamed on Trump. The Fed did not have to do the type of economic stimulus that it did in 2009, 2010. That's why the economy never healed. That's why we're in worse trouble today than we were back then. And remember, the Federal Reserve created the housing bubble. They're the reason we had a financial crisis. It was their economic policy that began early in the Bush era. You know, when we burst into the dot-com bubble, they deliberately inflated the housing bubble. They kicked the can down the road, and we caught up to the can in 2008, and then they kicked it again. And we're going to catch up to it now under, under, a, under Trump. But unfortunately, I think the powers that be, including the Fed, are already ready to blame this disaster on Donald Trump. He's the fall guy, and he has taken their bait by talking about how great the stock market is, by talking about how great the economy is. The stock market is a bubble, and the economy is a disaster. He shouldn't want to own this disaster. He should still be blaming how bad things are. Well, on what's Obama. going to happen is this going to continue. Some that. stocks in America are turning into a bubble. Uh, the bubble's going to come then it's going to collapse. And you should be very worried. But Henry, this is good for you because somebody has to report. So you have job security. You're a lucky soul. Well, yeah, TV ratings do seem to go up during crashes, but then they completely disappear when everyone is obliterated. So nobody is hoping for that. But so when is this going to happen? Later this year or next. Later this year or next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Write it down. And how big a crash could we be looking at? It's going to be the worst in your lifetime. Oh, I've had some pretty I, big ones I in know, my lifetime. It's long. It's going to be the biggest in my <laughs> lifetime, and I'm older than you. No, it's going to be serious stuff. It's going to be big. We've had uh, financial problems in America, let's use America, every four to seven years since the beginning of the Republic. Well, it's been over eight since the last one. This is the longest or the second longest in recorded history, so it's coming. 
And the next time it comes, you know, in 2008 we had a problem because of debt. Henry, the debt, now, the, that debt was nothing compared to what's happening now. In 2008, the Chinese had a lot of money saved for a rainy day. It started raining, they started spending the money. Now even the Chinese have debt, and the debt is so much higher. The Federal Reserve, the Central Bank in America, the balance sheet is up over five times since 2008. It's going to be the worst in your, the worst in my lifetime too. Be worried. I am worried. Good, good. What happens politically if that happens? Well, that's why I moved to Asia. <laughs> my, my children speak Mandarin because of what's coming. Uh, you're going to see uh, governments fail. You're going to see countries fail this time around. Iceland failed last time. Other countries fail. You're going to see more of that. You're going to see parties disappear. You're going to see institutions that have been around for a long time. Lehman Brothers had been around over 150 years, gone. Not even a memory for most people. Well, that's, you're going to see a lot more of that next time around, whether it's museums or hospitals or universities or financial firms. Knowing the future doesn't help one's peace of mind, Arthur. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and uh, I remember I had the, the dubious privilege of reading the text of the Third Secret of Fatima, which I must guard by oath from repeating, but it isn't pleasant. It isn't I have a whole stack of faxes here asking me to ask you about that, and you obviously cannot speak of that. Not factually, not word for word. I can't. I took a note. But it seems pleasant. And the less you know about it, the better. Except that there is going to be a reckoning and that uh, nobody existing on the face of this earth will be exempt from knowing uh, the power from on high. They will interpret it in different ways. That according stands to, their, to reason. According, yeah, according, according to, their, to their culture. According to their beliefs. That's right, and their culture and their bias. And uh, there will be people who even faced with the, with the certainty that there is a greater power above our heads will say... They will deny it. They will... The science, no, they'll, they'll reject it. The scientists, for example, will find a scientific explanation yes, for it. They will. They will. Remember the... The famous so-called Aurora Borealis in 1938? Well, uh, I, I certainly am aware of Aurora Borealis, but not one specific There was a specific one which they explained by saying Aurora Borealis. It really wasn't that at all. They all agreed it wasn't Aurora Borealis. The only one who put his finger on it was Adolf Hitler. And he Great said... Say. And he said what? Well, he was in Bechter's garden at the Wolf's Lair. That was his famous uh, place. When he, for, for weekends with his cabinet and Speer, Albert Speer who was a member of his cabinet his architect tells us in his second book that that night they all stood on the esplanade of his villa mm -hmm. in the Bavarian mountains looking out to the east and seeing these extraordinary sights of light and Hitler said yeah nun, now we have to shed blood we didn't shed blood in taking the Tsar, we didn't shed blood in taking Czechoslovakia, but now we're going to shed blood. So he took that as a sign. Oh, he took it as it was a sign. Because the virgin who told the children in Fatima in 1917 about this sign, she told them it would take place just before the Great World War. She said um, it will be just before they start killing millions. Can you tell us in a way that we can read between the lines with regard to the third prophecy? Um, is, there, is there a timetable that you are aware of that cannot speak, but cannot speak of that we can read between the lines on? Uh, yes. 
and no. There is a... It is not 200 years away. It is not 50 years away. It is not 20 years away. Number one. Well, that's... And number two, it involves the entire world system. It's not merely one area. It's not merely one religion. It's not merely one race. Will be apparent to all. All, without exception. Without exception, and it will be frightening. Okay, well, I think I've asked as much as I want to ask about that. <laughs> Let us uh, well, ask some questions. Is everything in place? You weren't supposed to relieve me. I know, but I felt like taking a shift. You like him, don't you? You like watching him. Don't be ridiculous. We're gonna kill him. You understand that? Morpheus believes he is the one. Do you? It doesn't matter what I believe. You don't, do you? Did you hear that? Hear what? Are you sure this line is clean? Yeah, of course I'm sure. I better go. Is everything in place? You weren't supposed to relieve me. I know, but I felt like taking a shift. You like him, don't you? You like watching him. Don't be ridiculous. We're gonna kill him. You understand that? Morpheus believes he is the one. Do you? It doesn't matter what I believe. Are you sure this line is clean? Yeah, of course I'm sure. I bring you a message, a message few of you will be able to believe, a message of great importance, a message I alone was able to read in the fires of the universe. 
But be not afraid, my friends. I also bring you the means with which to save yourselves. Save us from what? From the end of the world, friend. Which I don't expect you to believe. Uh, tell me something. Um, what's going on in this town anyway? Did your mayor die or what? World's coming to an end. Uh, how's that? Midnight tonight, the whole caboodle's gonna burn up. Oh. Where'd you get that? Fellow back there. With the one with the hat on? Mm-mm. Other one. He says the world is gonna come to an end? Midnight tonight. Where's he from? Drove in this morning. Wagon out front. Mm -hmm. Got a name? Trump. I bet it fits. Yeah, I heard. Uh, your name is Trump? Dr. Walter Trump. I am the only one. Just me. I can build a wall around your homes that nothing will penetrate. What do we do? How do we save ourselves? You ask, how do you build that wall? You ask, and I'm here to tell you. Please note that Einstein's clock is in precise synchronization with my control watch. Got it? Right, check them. What did I tell you? 88 miles per hour! Hi, this is Daniel Clamp. You know, no visit to New York is complete without a tour of the world's most fully automated office building. My Clamp Premier Regency Trade Center and Retail Concourse, headquarters of Clamp Enterprises and home of CCN, Clamp Cable Network Television. The death of Mr. Wing removes the last obstacle to developer Daniel Clamp's long-delayed Chinatown project. This quaint little shop, which once housed many rare objects from the Orient, must now make way for the future, Daniel Clamp style. Of the Clamp Premier Regency Office Center, where one man's dream became a reality. I hope you enjoyed today's tour, and don't forget, pick up your copy of Mr. Clamp's best-selling book, I Took Manhattan, on sale right here at our newsstand for only $19.95. Hey, that's Clamp. Let's go. Hey, go, 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 go. Mr. Clamp, is it true the building's been evacuated? Sir, is the building on fire? No, no, that's a false alarm. We've just got some uh, <laughs> problems. Problems? You got a guy in there in a Dracula costume broadcasting stuff with little green monsters. Are you trying to panic New York City? Absolutely not. So the monsters are real? I didn't say that. Then when are you saying that? Uh, just what I always say, Mike. 28 days. Six hours. 42 minutes. 12 seconds. That is when the world will end. I want to bring to the presidency out of the White House beginning in January of 1989. Panama is a friendly country. Tell it. of my Trump home mattress collection by Serta. Finally, the same luxury and comfort I demand in my hotels. Oh, they'll never count sheep again. Listen, why don't you come work for me? What do you have in mind? Something you were born to do. Welcome to Room 9.
Here is NBC News Washington correspondent Robert Abernethy. Good evening. The northeastern United States tonight suffered its worst electric power failure in history. In the next few minutes, we hope to tell you in detail what happened and to pass on what little is known about why it happened. First, what happened? Just before 5.30 tonight at 5.28 in New York and 5.21 in Boston, at the height of the rush hour, the lights went out in those cities and in most of the Northeast. Perhaps 30 million people in approximately 80,000 square miles were affected. There were massive traffic jams and confusion, especially at train stations. Thousands of people were trapped in darkened elevators. The New York City Transit Authority estimated that 800,000 people were underground in subways when the train slowed to a stop in the dark. Hospitals switched to emergency power. Candles and flashlights were at a premium. In New York, surgeons at St. Vincent's Hospital were in the midst of brain surgery when the hospital's emergency power plant failed. Police rushed an emergency generator to the hospital and the operation was completed. Airplanes could not land at New York's major airports because of the lack of light and signals on the ground. They were forced to circle, flew on to Philadelphia and Newark or later landed at their destinations, helped in by moonlight. As of now, power is back on in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and most of upstate New York, but it is not yet back on in New York City, and the power company there, Consolidated Edison, now says it probably won't begin to come back until perhaps 3 a.m., and even then there's doubt about whether capacity can be built up enough to handle the big early morning load. In New York City and other cities, there have been reports of looting. Police ordered anti-aircraft searchlights set up to flood Grand Central Station, Times Square, and other parts of New York, moving from building to building at a 45-degree angle, trying to spot any possible looters. At the height of the blackout in Boston, a riot broke out at the Massachusetts State Prison in Walpole, nearby. Between two and 300 inmates, more than half the population, broke out of their cells in the maximum security section of the prison and roamed the cell blocks, smashing windows, tables, and chairs. State troopers ringed the prison, waited, eventually used tear gas to try to get the men back in their cells. Governor John Volpe of Massachusetts ordered all National Guardsmen to report to their headquarters. Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York ordered all National Guard units in his state on the alert. This is an ABC News special report with Roger Grimsby in New York and Barbara Walters in Washington. Good evening. Two events last night and the aftermath today have dominated the news. New York City went totally dark last night, and tonight large parts of the city still are without power. And a U.S. Army helicopter strayed over the demilitarized zone between South and North Korea and was shot down by the North Koreans. Three Americans were killed and a fourth wounded and captured. We'll tell you about that and about how the White House handled the pot potentially explosive incident later in this program. Today, the lights were coming on again in parts of New York City, and the citizens there are just beginning to calculate the tremendous cost in confidence and in dollars of last night's total blackout. We have several reports on that. First, from New York, Roger Grimsby. The clock stopped exactly 24 hours ago, along with just about everything else here in New York. The only lights were automobile lights, otherwise the Great White Way was pitch black. Broadway theaters and restaurants closed up while you could eat by candlelight. It was very difficult to cook by it. Thousands were stranded in the city when airlines, commuter trains, and subways were knocked out of service. Thousands of others, all ages, took to the streets just for the fun of it. After all, New York City gets blacked out only once every 12 years. And there were thousands of others who took to the streets to plunder and to pillage. Over 2,500 looters and vandals arrested during the first eight hours of the blackout. Many more got away. The looters concentrated on small businesses, mostly in the poorer sections of the city, where unemployment and crime are chronically high. There were more than 40 serious fires. Two firemen died. Some of the fires were deliberately set, compounding the problem, false alarms, 1,100 of them. Mayor Bean summed it all up by calling it a night of terror. How did it all begin on one of the hottest, steamiest nights of the year in New York City? Well, to the north, towering thunderstorms jolted the rich suburb of Westchester County. Lightning knocked out transmission lines, setting off a cascading series of power station failures. And lights began flickering for 10 million residents in the metropolitan New York area. 
No lights, no refrigeration, no appliances, no air conditioning, no television, no elevators, and in some of the worst cases, no water. The city was closed down for the day. Things are now taking a turn for the better since it all began 24 hours ago. Don Farmer has details. We are in the midst of what appears to be a colossal and history-making blackout. People trapped in elevators and buildings, they have activated the emergency command center. You're staggering trying to take in as much information as you can. Mayor Bloomberg's advice is to go straight home. The subway system is down. Ottawa is completely without power now. The lightning quick domino series of failures. You gotta go to the bathroom and you can't even go nowhere. 50 million people are thought to have lost power. In 2003, a massive blackout struck major areas of the U.S. and Canada and was perceived as a wake-up call for the nation. We've got a real crisis in our grid and this is why, despite being a superpower, we have a grid that is comparable to a third world country and that's not right. But have 10 years of planning and preparation left us better off today? I don't think you can ever say with 100% confidence we won't have a blackout. Think of the internet for a moment as a weapon of mass destruction. I know that sounds like hyperbole, and I'm not talking about stealing credit cards by the million or a massive cyber espionage operation. I'm talking about the real possibility that some enemy of the United States will launch a cyber attack on one of our three electric power grids, plunging tens of millions of people into darkness for weeks or even months. No electric light or heat or refrigeration, no running water, no waste disposal. That's not a fictional scenario. I've spent the better part of a year and a half now talking to some of the best informed experts in and out of government. And there's general agreement that the Russians and the Chinese could do it, but probably won't. There's more concern about Iran and North Korea and a growing body of experts who worry that some terrorist group like ISIS, without the restraint that keeps governments in check, will find a way to buy the expertise. Unlike any other kind of threat this country has ever faced, it can be very difficult tracking the source, the origin of a cyber attack. Given all of that, you might assume that the government has formulated special plans to deal with the aftermath of such an attack. There are plans for hurricanes and blizzards and earthquakes, but this would be very different. The power outages caused by a targeted cyber attack would last longer and cover a much wider area than any of those natural disasters. So, is there a plan? No. I'm Ted Koppel. Some of you may remember me from my days anchoring Nightline. I didn't traffic in hysteria back then, and I'm not starting now. The internet can be used as a weapon of mass destruction, and our electric power grids are a target. That's a fact. Are we now talking about something, it's not a question of whether, but when? That's exactly the way that the, the four-star general who commands CENTCOM put it. He said, it's not a question of if, it's just a question of In a of place when. like Manhattan, for example, if the power goes out, you know how the fire department and the police spend the first couple of days getting people out of stalled elevators? Mm -hmm. You're talking about a community of, what, eight million people? The food in a place like Manhattan would run out in a couple of days. New York State has several million MREs, meals ready to eat. 
But when you take several million and you divide it by eight million, you're talking about maybe a two or three day food supply. Mm. What happens on day four? Yeah. What but happens on day this country is prepared. But I must tell you, after spending almost two years on this, I'm convinced that at some point or another, mm -hmm. it's going to happen. This is a very, very important program as far as I'm concerned. So I've brought in the best who I can think of, Dr. Peter Pry. How are you, sir? Thank you for having me, sir. My honor. I consider you the foremost expert on this subject, and you've written widely about it. You've testified. You're the executive director of the task force on national and homeland security, this electromagnetic pulse EMP, and uh, other threats on an accelerated basis. Director of the United States Nuclear Strategy Forum and Advisory Board to Congress on policies to counter weapons of mass destruction. Boy, you must be staying up at night. You must have nightmares. Um, you were an intelligence officer with the CIA, responsible for analyzing Soviet and Russian nuclear strategy and operational plans including EMP threats. So let's begin at the beginning. What's EMP? Well, ele electromagnetic pulse is basically a super energetic radio wave. It's got so much power that it can destroy electronics across the huge area. And in, 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 in fact, across the entire world in the case of a, a superstorm, a solar superstorm, the EMP can be made by nature, by the sun, by a solar superstorm, or it can be made by man by a nuclear weapon, and it can be made by non-nuclear weapons as well. In the case of a sun, what we're concerned about is the once in a century, once every 150 years solar superstorm. We have geomagnetic storms that happen every year that affect countries at high northern latitudes. Uh, but once every century, 150 years ago, is NASA's estimate, uh, a superstorm will happen that will create an EMP that is so powerful that it can destroy electronics across the entire world and put billions of lives at risk. Electromagnetic pulse. Yes. Is that what electricity does as it moves? What does that mean exactly? Well, uh, think of it this way. I think everybody has had a, uh, the experience of driving down a highway with your radio on, and then you pass under a high power line and you lose the radio. Then you come up back out on the other side. It wouldn't That's basically uh, destroy a EMP. city. There'd be no fallout. There'd be no blast effects. If you were standing on the ground directly beneath the explosion and it was detonating overhead at 300 kilometers, or it could be as low as 30 kilometers, it's in the vacuum of space so that you wouldn't even hear the explosion. There'd be no blast effects that would reach the ground. There'd be no radioactive fallout. Have we ever had one of these solar scenarios that you're talking about? You said every 100 or 150 years. Yes, back in 1859, there, there was a solar superstorm that we call the Carrington event. And at that time, this was the electronics, the cutting edge electronics of the day. This is an 1859 telegraph key. The colonial powers had strung telegraph systems all over the world, in India, China, Africa, the, uh, North America. We had them in North America. We just laid the transatlantic cable so that North America and Europe were connected for the first time. And when the pulse happened, it was so powerful. And I think even your viewers will be able to see this simple switch is you know, really crude, made of heavy metal and all the rest. So, telegraph keys like this were melted, uh, the wooden base burst into flame, telegraph stations burned down, uh, the telegraph wires burst into flame and caused forest fires all over the world. The pulse was so powerful, it reached down miles deep into the Atlantic Ocean and burned the cable out and had to be replaced. Now this didn't end civilization in 1859 because those were the horse and buggy days. And it wasn't well, what you're saying is, imagine this nationwide. Right. And when you start to think of electricity. Everything we do is associated with electricity, isn't it? Even if you try and fill up your car, the gas station, the pump, electricity. Everything we do is related to electricity, no? Absolutely. All the critical infrastructures depend upon it. Communications, transportation, banking and finance. Um, we did an experiment <clears throat> on, the, on the commission and I, I just I, I went to a grocery store and picked up an apple. And I wondered, how did this apple get to this grocery store in the Washington, D.C. area, you know, the simple apple? And tra tracing the history of that apple, it turns out it was, uh, it was grown in an orchard in Washington. It was harvested mechanically. Uh, it was cleaned and packaged mechanically using electronic systems and electronic assembly belts. It was put on a refrigerated truck and then drove drove across the country so that people locally in Washington, D.C. could eat the apple. So even the simple apple depends upon hundreds of electronic systems in order to deliver it to us. And we wouldn't have the apple or any other food. In fact, there's a, only a 30-day food supply in the country to feed 320 million people. And water would stop immediately. 
you know, when you turn on the tap, it requires millions of volts in order to deliver that water through your tap. And the commission couldn't figure out how, how would we keep uh, 320 million people alive with no food and new, no water, possibly for years. We estimate that uh, if we had a blackout in this country that lasted one year, and that's entirely possible in these scenarios that we're talking about, we could lose up to 90% of our population to starvation, disease, and societal collapse. Seven weeks room rent. Unless I get my money, they can't go on that boat. What did you do with the room rent I gave you? I gave him the money. Well, he said he gave you the money. He what only gave want? me $28. Well, that was right. Seven. I gave you more than $28. No, it's $13 a week. That's right. We was there seven weeks. That's right. Where's all the money? I gave him the $28. What do you mean $28? That's all the guys got coming. Wait a minute, $13 a week. Yeah. I gave you seven times 13. That's $28. I gave it to him. Don't say that. Don't say it. You didn't give that money. All I got is twenty-eight dollars. Well, that's right. Set of tax thirteen is twenty-eight. Come here, come in. Would you excuse us? Can you use this for a minute, please? <laughs> prove that to me. You want me to prove it? Prove it. Okay. Now let me see. There were seven weeks. Well, right? I'm, I'm good at the fight. I'm good at the fight. Go ahead. Seven weeks. And it was twenty-eight, right? Now, seven and twenty-eight. You say you claim that seven and twenty-eight goes thirteen times? That's right. Prove it. Seven and two. Seven and two. Seven will not go into two. No, no, certainly not. No matter how much you push this big seven into that little two, it's not going to go in there. No. Therefore, you don't want to hurt that little two. What do you mean? That's a cute little two, ain't it? What you going to do with it? I'm not going to push that big seven into that little two. What you going to do with it? I'm going to put that little two right there. Now, I'm going to carry the seven because it's getting heavy. I'm going to put it right there. Now, seven from eight. One. What? A minute ago, uh -oh. I had some argument about a little two. This little two down here. Do you mind if I use it now? Go ahead, please. Thank you. So, I'm going to put that little two right there. Seven and twenty-one. Three times. Three times. Seven and twenty-eight. Thirteen oh, times. No. Don't encourage him, please. We'll uh, multiply this. Put down, uh, put down. <laughs> Come on, put down 13. Put You've down. got no right to let money sit Come on, money. put down 13. Okay. Come on, put down. 13. Now put down a seven. Seven weeks. All right, now. 
Nikolai, now you claim the seven times 13 is what? 28. Prove it. Get a load of it. Seven times three. Uh, 21. Seven times one. Seven. Seven and one. Eight. And two to count. Put down, put down 13 seven times. Put down 13 seven times. Seven times. One, two, two three, three, four, five, six, six seven. seven. Now, you claim that all that added up amounts to what? 28. Give me the chalk, I'll add it up. There's a piece, get over here. You know, the flag will come out right. Hey, yeah. Uh, there's three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. 